Um, we have a wonderful two-part session this week um, featuring some incredible speakers uh, who I'm going to introduce in one moment talking about a sustainable production toolkit. And I see we have a huge crowd today because that is a huge draw for all of you. Um, and uh, that's really thrilling. Something I've been thinking about during our two week intermission is uh, the reason it's drawn so many of all of us here to the table today um, is during this quarantine and this pause as we all have been thinking about what, um, what happens when we don't pay attention to science, right? As we're all inside and as we don't look at the facts around us, what happens? And so instead here we all are looking at the facts and taking action here together in our field, in our lane. And that gives me such hope. And so with that, I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers and bear with me as I screen shared, I lost my document uh, with all of their names. So bear with me one moment because I want to get these introductions right because we have fantastic speakers. So with no further ado, I introduce Michael Banta, who is the production manager for the Barnard College Department of Theater. We have Lauren Gaston, who is a freelance costume designer and illustrator. She designs for theater, dance, opera, and works in TV film as a background fitter and costumer. We have Sandra Goldmark, who is a set designer and professor at Barnard College, where she serves as the Director of Sustainability and Climate Action. We have Edward T. Morris, who is a set and projection designer, a lecturer at the New School, and a member of the United Scenic Artists Local 829 and Wing Space Theatrical Design. We have Elizabeth Mack, who is a lighting and projection designer, and we have Danielle Worley as our moderator. Some of you may have already seen her speak here during our Green Quarantine series. She is a scenic designer, a garden designer, an activist, an educator, and so much more. And I am so thrilled to turn this session over to all of them. Great. So Danielle, do I, I'll hand the mic to you. Yeah, great. Hi, everybody. What we'd love to do is, um, is if you can turn your screens on. This is a, because this is just an hour session, it's really great to, to give these folks a, a room of uh, faces for them to really engage with. And then, um, so um, our team is going to talk for a little while, and then we're going to jump into um, a question and answer period. You can have two choices. We're gonna, I'm gonna sort of work the room and see who wants to ask questions. And you can also put your questions in the chat and uh, Molly's gonna be watching the chat. We know folks on YouTube, you can ask, add your questions in YouTube as well. And Chrissy is gonna be watching those. So we'd love to have a really engaged conversation in about an hour. So, um, so here we go. I'd like to introduce to you who's going first. I believe it is um, Sandra and Mike. Me. Yeah. Great, I'll turn it to you. So who is doing this? There we go. Here's some slides. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you all um, virtually. Um, I see some familiar names and faces. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we are a group of backstage artists, like almost everyone on this call, I believe, um, who share a passion for sustainability. And what we're sharing with you today is we're calling the Sustainable Production Toolkit. Uh, it's an initiative to help promote, promote environmental and social well-being within this industry, very simply. The document we want to share with you today is a work in progress, and it's geared towards people on this call, theater makers, production managers, stage managers, designers, artists, actors, people for whom sustainability is of interest. And we want to acknowledge that while this is an incredibly difficult time for our industry, for our nation, um, we believe, as Molly indicated that there is an opportunity to make change in this moment, in this pause. And so we're hoping to um, get some feedback and thoughts from you today on how to do that together. Um, so what we're uh, gonna show you today, as I said, we're calling it a toolkit. We've organized it into a series of modules. This is the full table of contents. Um, we're not gonna show you the whole thing today. Um, the modules range from how to connect the work of sustainability to your organizational mission, all the way to specific budgeting templates uh, and very concrete tips and tools to reduce emissions. We're thinking that this toolkit will ultimately be used in two ways, either as a read through resource that you could, you know, on your own with your organization use as a guide, um, or to be used as a series of um, facilitated, um, in a series of facilitated sessions where we could work with your organization to help you uh, 
get through the modules that are relevant for you. Today, within this table of contents, what we're going to hit is um, the highlights of making the case within your organization and some of the concrete tools for scenery, props, and costumes. We also have a session next week at this time to, to look through some of the other modules. Um, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the breadth of the crises we are facing. COVID, the economic fallout from COVID, systemic racism in our industry and nationwide, and the climate crisis. Um, these rather overwhelming problems are also interconnected, I believe, we all believe, I think. Um, because we, the patterns of exploitation and extraction that shape our economy and lead to climate change are also the patterns that shape the way we make theater, and they're also the patterns that are disproportionately impacting communities of color in this country and around the world. So while this document focuses on tools that can lessen environmental impacts, we are also striving to connect the dots between social and environmental sustainability. And we are not able, of course, in this one toolkit to offer solutions for all of these big problems, but we do believe, um, and we hope that one of the things we can talk about today is that the right solutions for these problems will be intersectional in their approach. Um, so what this means, especially in this moment, is to acknowledge that there cannot be any real progress towards a sustainable future without also dismantling structural racism and ending violence against black, brown, and indigenous peoples. So this presentation is just a starting point for how we can begin to do this work um, and how we can begin to do it together as a community. So we welcome participation, feedback, thoughts, ideas, Thank you so much for being here today, and we are going to dive in. To echo Sandra, um, yes, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we start this presentation with making the case and really diving into the why, why we do this um, type of work, how to frame this conversation with your organization, um, whether it makes sense to start small or think big, and turning those ideas from vision to habit. Do you want to, oh, there we go. So these are some of the reasons why that we have identified um, for ourselves. Um, these are not the only reasons, but to hit the highlights, um, we see this work as a way to prioritize people over materials, over products, um, kind of like Sandra was saying, smart sustainability measures work in tandem with promoting fair wages, equity, diversity, inclusion, and public health and safe working conditions. We also believe that these measures um, don't necessarily mean a more expensive, um, you know, more expensive to, to approach and to realize. Um, you can actually have cost savings or uh, cost neutral with rolling in some of these, these strategies. It's also a great opportunity for leadership um, and also a great way to build trust by living into your values as an organization. Because um, I think we think it's important to really start um, from a value-based conversation with, when approaching this work and linking it um, to your organization's mission in that way. All right, next slide. So here are a few strategies for how to frame the conversation with your organization. Um, again, starting with your mission um, and reviewing that content and seeing how it can align with um, sustainability from a human, environmental, and from a financial standpoint. Um, identifying potential champions or stewards within your organization, um, just as the team here today identified one another as being interested in this line of work. Um, and continue to include as many diverse voices in the process. Um, so we see our, you know, our conversation here today as a step in that direction. And then making a plan unique to your company's mission, size, capacity. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we uh, invite you to think big and also feel permission to start small. Um, when it comes to making a plan, um, too frequently, there's kind of an all or nothing approach when it comes to sustainability. And it's easy be, to become uh, paralyzed in the pursuit of that kind of perfection. Um, so it might seem like an overwhelming amount of information, um, but it's not about 
perfection or buying your way into sustainability. Again, it's about embracing it as a core value and um, having a human to human values based conversation. What do we care about? Why do we care about this work um, for our company? And from that authentic place, you can start um, you can start small with goals that resonate with that authentic value and with you. Hi, so um, uh, moving into sort of concrete steps. Uh, so something we're gonna touch on in all departments is sourcing. Um, and this is something that uh, good general sourcing practices can be used by everyone at a theater from uh, the costume shop to the development office. So there's some good general rules. Uh, you know, we love the theater because it is live and in person and that, that does require things. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I'm just gonna read this. We must transform all the elements of the take make waste system, how we manage resources, how we make and use products and what we do with the materials afterwards. Only then can we create a thriving economy that can benefit everyone uh, within the limits of our planet. Uh, you know, this was from a little while ago, but I think is even more uh, prescient uh, today. Next slide, please. So um, when you are uh, buying materials for the theater, now, you know, we emphasize because a lot of us like work in scenery and costumes and stuff, but these are things that can be applied to anything uh, that any operations manager is purchasing purchasing for a theater, but um, shop and build with used materials wherever possible. Uh, when you do have to purchase new materials, uh, keep in mind some simple principles. Uh, you know, is it recyclable? Is it toxic? Is it multi-use? Uh, you might want to make a hierarchy that articulates a preference. Uh, uh, free materials is outlined on, on the bottom of the slide, uh, you know, going from non-toxic new materials to, um, uh, to toxic materials that you can justify using, but you want to make clear that you've, you've looked for alternatives first. Um, uh, another great way to do this is to check for uh, third party uh, certifications like FFC, FSC for lumber, uh, or even just Energy Star for office equipment. Um, uh, a really important uh, an action step that one can take during this pause that we're in is to make um, uh, a cheat sheet of local vendors. Um, it, you know, local uh, producers do not tend to overproduce as much as things that come from Amazon, for example. So making a list of local vendors, especially those uh, owned by women uh, or people from the BIPOC community uh, is really helpful. If you're in a major metropolitan area, someone has probably already started this work and you can sort of uh, adapt it to uh, find theatrical vendors. Um, and uh, anytime when theaters are being asked for specific actions related, related to anti-racism, uh, this is a, a, a tangible action set that you can take right now. Um, moving ahead one slide, we'll look at, here's an example of one organization's uh, list of sustainable vendors uh, and what each of them specializes in. So this is the sort of thing that someone could do for um, uh, your own uh, theater, depending on what your mission is. And I'll pass it on to Scenery. Hi, uh, this is Mike again. Um, so for scenery, we believe the most straightforward way to reduce the carbon footprint is to reduce the use of new materials. And at Barnard, where we've developed this approach, we start with the budget. That is, we set a target that is no more than 50%. Uh, um, I think we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, we value our, uh, we put a dollar valuation on our scenery stock. And we break our budget into three columns where we track scenery, uh, we track stock used and new materials separately so that we can be sure that we're spending no more than our budget on, uh, more than 50% of our budget on new materials. Um, we have found that we actually end up saving a lot of money uh, in materials purchase when we emphasize using stock um, and we're able to move that money that we would have spent on new materials towards the labor and transport that is necessary to deal with sourcing used materials. We know that it does take a little bit more time and effort to track down some things that are used uh, rather than just ordering anything new from, uh, from the lumber yard or whatever. Um, but we've also found that we save a lot of money on disposal. We went in one year from, uh, from renting four dumpsters for a season to renting zero with this approach. Um, and uh, you can you can imagine how that makes us feel pretty good. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, this is an example of how we uh, track the material use for one particular item of scenery. So uh, piece by piece, we've broken it down, stock materials, used materials, and new. And so each one, uh, each of these uh, cells is pulling from a price list that we can update uh, as necessary, but that uh, does track each individual unit. So we define stock materials as things that we have in storage or things that we've actually bought for previous productions and that are still on hand. So they're sort of sunk cost materials. Uh, used materials are things that are pre-existing that we bought expressly for this project. So not used that we already have, but used that we go out and purchase and actually spend money on. And then uh, as Edward noted, we choose new materials um, that have the lowest possible impact and also that can be reused in the future that can become stock materials in the future. So again, um, we, with this approach, we're trying to shift the, uh, the emphasis of our spending from materials to people. So we have, uh, we've found that the less money we spend on the materials, the more we can spend on design fees, on overhire. Um, we know that um, practicing reuse and non-toxic shop practices uh, does sometimes take more time or labor. So it's important to account for that to consciously shift dollars from material line to labor lines. And it's also important to note that um, pivoting to a human-centered spending model can be an asset when you're writing grants, um, raising funds, and that kind of thing. Next. Uh, we've, throughout the, the kit, we've, we've chosen to include case studies um, to, to give a visual sense of what can be achieved with these approaches. So um, our case study for scenery here is a design by Edward Morris, who has already spoken, uh, which is a set made entirely from recycled doors and windows. And we like to show that um, sustainable scenery doesn't mean everything is built out of cardboard or things that you find by the side of the road. It can be beautiful. We can view um, sustainable material choice as simply another design constraint, not, uh, not a limitation in the negative sense. It can feed creativity. Uh, you can see, uh, according to the slide, that uh, the props were rented, uh, footlights were rented, and all the windows and frames were saved or returned to other theaters. So the production closed green. Hi, sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, so, uh, talking about costumes, um, uh, when it comes to take, make waste, a textile production is one of the biggest offenders. Um, uh, using an estimation from uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, there will be 7,200 uh, garbage trucks worth of clothing incinerated or landfill by the time, uh, uh, you know, by the time this, uh, we've given this presentation, um, uh, sorry, in a given day. Uh, textile production has a history of exploitative labor, uh, child labor, uh, immense greenhouse gas emission, emissions, water pollution, and uh, use of hazardous working conditions and chemicals. Uh, we acknowledge that the theater industry operates at an entirely different scale than the large scale fashion industry. Uh, and so the impacts are not as great, but it's worth knowing this context when it comes to designing and choosing resources that positively uh, impact people and our planet. Um, next slide. Um, so communicate and commit. Um, uh, a good way for, you know, for all of these uh, sections and uh, departments is to set quantitative goals with your team. You know, as Michael said, Barnard has for scenery the wonderful uh, plan of 50% uh, recycled materials for every production. Um, a, and a way to start easy is to just start with like one set of costumes. For example, um, uh, the costume designer Jacqueline Duran and Sh Sinead uh, Kadao uh, worked with uh, the leading actress on Beauty and the Beast, the film, and set a goal for 100% sustainable costumes uh, for her character. Uh, and that can be used as a way of sort of inspiring um, uh, other people to want to uh, follow that. Uh, another easy goal is to uh, send 100% of your textile scraps to a company called Fab Scrap that will uh, take them away. They do do it for a fee, but um, they will ensure that their your costume shops can go to very, very low waste. Um, 
Uh, yes, so for this next slide, this is a wonderful tool uh, for picking fabric. This is by a, a, a group called Reformation, and they have what called the ABC, sort of grading fabrics. Uh, I found this to be very helpful. I didn't know how wasteful uh, silk was, for example. But this is a way um, for costume designers and costume shops when trying to decide between two similar fabrics, uh, which is better for the environment and which is worse. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful resource. Moving ahead. So this is a wonderful case study by uh, Lauren Gaston, who has spoken, we'll hear uh, more from. Uh, but so for this one, they, they committed and communicated the goal to create uh, dance costumes using uh, secondhand single-use plastics uh, that created a sonic and a sculptural quality. Uh, the choreographer, Jody Sperling, was behind this and uh, was committed to sustainability as part of her mission at Time Lapse Dance. Uh, for the new dance piece, Plastic Harvest, uh, Jody sought to explore the impact of single-use plastics on our bodies and in the oceans. So 50% um, of the costume was new and 50% was reclaimed our secondhand plastics. Um, and sourcing secondhand significantly cuts down on material costs and increases the labor hours. Um, in this case, it meant spending more money on people to seek out the materials versus just the materials themselves. Um, the artisans contracted specifically uh, for this build uh, were able to name their rate to do so. And I'll pass it on to props. All right, props. Um, much of what has been said already is true for props as well in terms of prioritizing reuse, um, tracking reuse, and putting a value on your stock and storage. This is another example um, done by Barnard College uh, where they tracked how much they spent on props throughout their season and then took an average, um, they took the average cost per item per show and then at the end of the season average those costs um, in order to determine what the value of their stock was. Um, and this, you know, helps them advocate for more storage space and more labor to maintain this really valuable resource. All right, next slide. And again, it's um, spending money on people, not stuff. Um, because your stock represents thousands of dollars worth of value, um, placing a monetary value on your stock when you budget your show can help you track reuse and also advocate for more storage space as we as we mentioned um, and also non-toxic um, choosing non-toxic materials like we've discussed is also a great choice for props um, here we have just briefly a, a beautiful case study by sandra goldmark at the denver center for the performing arts um, she created this very rich and layered effect with um, found objects and items as you can see here in the photo and it looks like there's actually a backstage video tour too. So we'll make sure you can get that link if you are interested in learning more. Hi, um, we thought that we should add a section about top, uh, the, uh, a section about travel, like the topic of travel and emissions is really too big to go into detail right now, but we thought it was important to mention. Um, mostly because our industry necessi necessitates that we gather in one place. And while that's a good thing, we need to think about the greenhouse gas emissions and really how that relates to how artists, staff, and audience arrive at and depart from a performance venue. So as you can see in this pie chart, in a study done by Julie's Bicycle in 2008 on the UK music industry, it shows that audience travel accounts for 43% of the music industry's emissions. The International Civil Aviation Organization has a travel emissions calculator if you're interested in starting to calculate what your impact is. But I think ultimately it necessitates having larger artistic conversations with your company and with your institution. Um, who are the people that the theater is hiring? Where are they based? Where is your venue? And how do you get people there? And what is your operating model? Um, a model that's often proposed for travel is the avoid, avoid, reduce, replace, offset model. So avoid is how do you avoid creating emissions in the first place? Things like housing artists close to rehearsal spaces and theaters, maybe opting for a virtual conference call or live streaming. Um, and then the next step is reduce. So how can you reduce the amount of travel and travel emissions? Um, several examples are like, 
think in thinking about the operating model, if it's touring, how much are you touring and what are you bringing with you? Can you work with local vendors to reduce tour volume? What kind of programming are you doing? Um, how is your audience getting to you? Can you, can you offer audience public transportation deals? And also, can you hire locally? Can you create longer residencies for out of town artists and pay them equitably? Um, or can you also incentivize artists to take slower transport? Uh, the next step is replace. There are fly or drive calculators to estimate what mode of transportation might do the least harm. So we can see in this chart that one BBC study looked at CO2 emissions per passenger per kilometer. And there are general rules like planes are worse than cars are worse than trains, but actually there are no hard and fast rules because some trains are worse than others and a full or direct flight might actually be better than driving a really long distance alone. And then the last step in the avoid, reduce, replace offset model is carbon offsets. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with carbon offsets, um, offsetting emissions means paying to compensate for your local greenhouse gas emissions by canceling out emissions in another part of the world. So there are some airlines like JetBlue, British Airways, Delta, United, Qantas that already participate in these offset programs. And these programs um, fund things like renewable energy projects, methane capture projects, and tree planting projects. Some theaters add an option for audiences as part of their checkout or part of their subscription package to pay a small fee towards offsetting their estimated transport. Um, however, I think it's important to mention that the offset option is often the most problematic and least sustainable because there's no way to ensure that the offset you're paying towards will actually happen or that it will be a permanent solution or that your offset isn't being double counted with someone else's. A good way to even think about it if you're starting to look for programs through certifications. There are standard groups like the Gold Standard. Um, I think. Hi. Sandra. Yeah. Hi, you guys. Back again. Um, so I wanted to remind you that there we did not cover today lighting, sound, projections, uh, stage management. That's next week. So if you're wondering, that's why. Um, I wanted to sort of remind you why, we're, why we embarked on this project, the five of us, to make this toolkit. The idea is to hopefully make it easier, like a good set of tools to make it easier for any theater or theatrical organization to reduce their emissions and to tackle sustainability. So given that, we're trying to make this toolkit something that is adaptive, that is, can be adjusted for your needs and that you could use in a way that works for you. Again, it's a work in progress, so we're looking for feedback, and we're looking for partner organizations who want to help us test drive this thing. Um, we, as I said, we are imagining a version where some organizations might uh, do a kind of grab and go, take the, take the thing, read it through on their own, and others who would want to work on a more um, uh, buffet-like basis, picking certain modules and getting feedback and facilitated sessions. So in the spirit of helping us build this and collaborate, the first we're going to turn it, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle in just a moment. The first thing though, we're imagining two ways that this can work. One is right now I'm going to put in the chat a survey where after um, you can give some feedback, uh, especially people who said, oh, I'd like a copy of this or that. Please do fill out the survey, then we'll have your email and we can email everybody and, and figure out um, what people were looking for. Uh, second, obviously, we're looking, hoping for some feedback and ideas right now. And then the third is, if you are an organization who might be interested in doing this, please, or doing some portion of this over the coming months or year, reach out to us. Um, so for now, thank you for, for listening, and let's talk. We're excited to hear your questions and ideas. Amazing. Thanks all of you. I so appreciate that. There's so much to talk about. Um, I'm just going to launch into with the first question and I want y'all to um, just sort of give me some kind of um, acknowledgement whenever you want to speak in with a question. But because this is, um, I'm super curious and because I'm sure a lot of people too want to know how do we start? How, how did y'all start this? It, uh, how did you come to find each other? I'll jump in. Um, we started this, I think all, I mean, we all had an individual practice of some kind. At, you know, Sandra and Michael spoke to the work they've done at 
Barnard College, Edward and I um, try to incorporate uh, reuse into our own design um, practice and um, work. And I um, had been aware of Sandra's work and it had seen a presentation she did at the BGA um, earlier in the summer. And I saw Edward there as well. And Edward and I had just um, designed a production together that got canceled, unfortunately, because of COVID. Um, so really, we uh, all got together based on a, you know, a shared interest in sustainability. And, um, you know, it, and our group is still growing <laughs> with Elizabeth after, you know, doing the wing space presentation. Um, she joined in and um, hopefully we can keep growing <laughs> um, together here with this conversation. Amazing. Anybody have a question? You want to jump in? Uh, yes, Alyssa. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I um, have just recently jumped on to watching your uh, Wing Space presentations, and so thank you so much for doing this. Um, I was part of the group that Danielle visited at uh, DePaul University last year, and um, since then I've been really uh, looking into sustainable productions. Um, I'm a scenic designer, but I kind of want to, um, I do want to kind of um, pursue a graduate degree in sustainability and then pursue that as a career, but then definitely bring it back to my roots in the theater community. And um, I was wondering if anybody has an, any advice on what kind of degree I should pursue because there's a lot of weird sustainability degrees out there and I'm not sure really like how to create one that will be most productive for this specific goal. Um, I think I can take a stab at this. Uh... First of all, kudos, awesome, do it, I'm so excited. Do it fast and get back to the industry and fix everything. <laughs> um, there, is a, there is no like right now sort of masters in sustainability for theater or anything like that, but there's a lot of sustainability management programs that are more, some are more geared towards public policy and some are more geared towards business. Um, and Ian Garrett might be a good resource to see if there's one um, geared towards the arts that he knows of that we don't. You might just drop, um, drop us an email, I'd be happy to sort of connect you with Ian and put, maybe put you in touch with a couple ex-students I have who are in sustainability management programs, if that would be useful. Maybe also John Trevellini, who's at Columbia School of the Arts, oh, who's yeah. doing his master's in sustainability right now and is the technical director for the shop. Yes, he, uh, yes, he would be a great person to connect with. That would be awesome. So that was John Trevellini at Columbia, but just email us and we'll, yeah. we'll give you, you know, his real email address. Okay. So we've been seeing a lot of this, Charlie, um, uh, with the BGA, we've been seeing um, year after year more people doing dual majors of uh, sustainability and theater. So we've been getting um, uh, inquiries and resumes and um, we could probably search that on some of the emails and maybe get you in touch with people who've tried various things in this also. Um, it, there, this was unheard of uh, 12 years ago when the, the BGA started. And now Ian Garrett, as uh, Sandra mentioned, uh, is a professor of sustainability in theater. So he's a great, great source. But there's a bunch, there's a bunch of people, we're so excited that a bunch of people are doing this. And to just to, uh, add to that, Ian uh, Garrett is at York University in, um, in Canada, in Toronto. And I believe the program is an undergrad program, uh, but he's the person who would, you probably should reach out to the most because he's, he has his finger on the pulse of exactly where these maybe new um, graduate programs might be popping up or he might be able to guide you into actually creating a program, which I think, you know, with a lot of this stuff, we, uh, all of us need to be trailblazers. So. If you have this interest, as these folks found each other, this is what you do. Okay, next. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Kelsey, go ahead. 
Hi, I'm a master's student at Carnegie Mellon, um, currently hoping to write my thesis on more sustainable practices in scenic design. Um, one of our big issues is that we don't have any storage for sets, so we are constantly throwing away and have no stock right now. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to deal with storage or how to create storage opportunities to address one of these giant issues? Sorry, uh, where did you say you were? Carnegie Mellon? Carnegie Mellon, yeah. Mm. Um, obviously, space is, is tough for a lot of places, and we're in New York City, so that is um, maybe especially true at Barnard. But I will say that once we put a value on our, on our stock and showed how much it was, how much it was uh, worth and how much it got used, we were able to actually make the case for increased storage. Um, and so I think maybe the first step is to do the sort of data collection and have some numbers to say, this is how much we're throwing away. This is how much we would save in not only new materials purchases, but disposal costs. And even um, maybe the carbon, if you can figure out a carbon footprint thing, that is a little harder to do um, with materials, but uh, Still yeah, I, I think so many uh, data, data really can drive an argument pretty, Pretty far so that would be my suggestion I don't know if anyone else has thoughts I have a few thoughts uh, to share Kelsey we recently spoke with um, the an organization called the green spark group and they started an initiative called sustainable lockup for that you know kind of for the very reason you're describing um, and so you might look into that to see because they found it very inefficient to um, store materials show to show, and this is for TV and film, I should mention, but um, they were able, you know, to work with multiple stakeholders to find kind of a win-win a situation for storage across a couple different production companies. Um, so you might look into that as well. I had one thought also, um, which was, uh, Susan with the BGA, is that right now, given what's happened with the COVID and the economy, there are a lot of buildings, there's a lot of commercial space that's about to become, to open up as people give up leases and give up space. And you might be able to search around, especially if you're in Pittsburgh, to see if you can find spaces where uh, people are, are looking, you know, that might be temporary while you're, while you're gaining your data, but it might be a place you could use now um, to get started. Those are great points, thank you. Danielle, we have a few questions in the chat and uh, three raised virtual hands. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, so chat, I just wanted to shout out to Anna because uh, um, Tanya Beer is doing a ton of work. She's located in Australia. Um, and so check that out in the chat. Um, her work is great. She definitely, we've had contact with the BGA. Um, let's see, whose virtual hand is up? Yeah, Paloma. Uh, Hey, this is just um, going to the question of storage um, that uh, I know that Paper Mill Playhouse on the costume front got rid of their costume storage and they have an agreement with TDF where they just give them all their costumes and then they get, they're allowed to like rent for free. So, you know, I, I don't know if other sort of space sharing uh, rental agreements exist or like but, but it seems like a model that could also work for scenery as well. Yeah, and you know, I'm gonna jump into the, um, Sean asked the questions about commercial and storage, um, which is, um, is another thing. So um, how that works in, in the way I design is, um, it's most of what I do is, is talking to people. It's about communication. And so we're not going directly to one person's storage where it's, it's, it's having an access to a large, especially in a metropolitan area, area, you can access a lot of different people's storage and that might not be in your town. Sometimes it's actually reaching out a little bit further, but there's a lot of groups. One of the great groups in New York City is Art Cube, which posts things constantly nonstop. Um, and I know Art Cube is represented in many other cities, so look that up. Next question. Anybody else have a virtual hand up that I don't see? That, um, Nate has a virtual hand up. Yeah, Nate. Hey everybody, um, I have more of a, a hearts and minds sort of question. I find, um, I'm a stage manager, so 
as someone who is uh, more just present for the process, what I see as problematic is um, more convincing directors, artistic directors, and designers um, to see reuse of items, um, found object design as an opportunity for creativity and not as a way of eliminating creativity. And so I was hoping the panel could speak to how they've been able to convince their artistic teams to kind of jump on board with this as an idea. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, if you come back next week, we have a section that is devoted not only to stage management, but another separate section um, uh, about freelancers and how to inspire buy-in. And um, I mean, as, as with many things, unfortunately, practice seems to be uh, very key. Uh, a lot of us have made the mistake of sort of going in, I guess, uncomfortable phrase like guns blazing, like we're gonna do this sustainable show. And yeah, that, that gets like a hard no 100% of the time. Uh, but if you, uh, there are different techniques that, that, that we, we, we talk about in uh, next week's thing about uh, this sort of soft touch. And, um, and also, you know, something like this document, like sending it to, uh, to, to leadership to sort of show how important it actually is to their mission. Um, and also uh, in sort of the longer version of this document, we end with one or two examples. We didn't get to sort of all of them in our sort of abbreviated one hour presentation, but like just showing people like concrete proof that um, uh, sustainable design can be aesthetically and artistically rewarding um, is something we're, we're trying to promote with this. It seems to me um, that, well, we're aiming this kit the current version of it at least is aimed mostly at production managers. Um, knowing that Edward and Sandra and Lauren have all been designers who've gone in guns blazing or maybe softer touch, but um, it's really hard, I think, for a solo designer to come in and sort of impose that from the design side. Um, and if the organization can start with that as the mission, I think it's a lot easier. Um, and so that's what we have chosen to do at Barnard and we start the conversation with every director and designer saying, this is our mission. So Nate, you're right. Um, if, you, if you don't have sort of an organizational buy-in, you, you, sometimes you might not get very far. And we just say, this is our goal. We were spending mo no more than 50%. And we treat it as any other budget number to say, sorry, that is what we have. Um, you can have this or you can have that. You can't have both kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's how we have dealt with it. And generally, if you, if you foreground it and don't surprise them, um, they, they're usually, um, they'll work with you, if you know what I mean. And I will say, if you go in guns a-blazing as the freelancer, but do it nicely, you can have some amazing results. There's a couple production managers on this call I see who, <laughs> with whom, I don't know if my guns were blazing or not, I don't want to go there, but did, we did amazing shows together, and um, I feel like if you, if you introduce the conversation the right way, it can, it can work. Or Nate? At worst, you could point them to Danielle Burley and say you can win a Tony Award by doing upcycling. Hey, uh, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Um, someone's asking about um, how you get it, how you get buy-in from the heads of departments. And also, I want to add to that, uh, Sandra and Michael, and specifically Michael. Um, how, because you are a production manager, how did how do you communicate to your um, to other people about this? To other people, uh, both designers and the heads, um, your carpenters, your your other people in your department. Well, the to designers, it goes with the offer letter to say this is this is our policy. So you should be thinking about this from the beginning. We have a for set designers. I'll send this, the list of stock scenery, and um, we do a site visit whenever possible, and sort of walk through and say, look under the stage, we have you know, 10 trees and a bunch of bamboo and stuff. So maybe you could use this or, you know, so things that we've been hanging on to and I walk them around campus and we look at things um, because obviously someone who's new to the organization won't know what we have in nooks and crannies. So I think that's important. Um, you know, for us now, head of department is, is a pretty small list because we're a small college. So generally if we have complete buy-in and support from our uh, TD and our costume shop manager. And so they just manage their budgets in accordance with the, with the plan, basically. Does that answer the, the question? Since we don't have any turnover really in our staff, it's not, it hasn't really been an issue in onboarding people since we all decided as a group to, to follow up with this mission. 
I would also well, think it, it, it my, was, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I would also think that the the statement of prioritizing people over product makes a huge difference in convincing your staff to take part in this. I mean, that's you're basically telling them you value them more, which I think is an amazing message and very helpful to build morale and get people on board. That's absolutely, and you know, sometimes I'll say. By doing this, we have been able to increase our design fees, which is true. Um, and so I think most designers are like, okay. We've talked about um, uh, maybe even incentivizing it in a monetary way, but we haven't really figured out a, a way to do that that feels fair. To say, look, if you do 100% recycled, you get this much. So that's still something we've, we've, you know, we've, we've kicked that around, but we haven't actually tried that yet. Seems a little... Mm. I see. Um, yeah, um, my concern is that I have a TD who's been with the company you know, 25 years, I've been with it 20 years, we worked really well together, but he's very set in his ways. And so having that discussion to get the, the working relationship, he also does a lot of our design work. Um, you said that as a group, you decided, so how did you start that first conversation? You just said, I've seen this really great idea and I'd like us to try it. Yeah, well, I think this is where the start small. Buy him a drink, you know, <laughs> yes. And, 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 and know that it, it takes a long time to form a habit. So you try something once, even for us still years, several years in, we have to sort of, we have tried very consciously to make this our habit and to overcome those years of, diff of practices. It's not easy. So to even acknowledge that and to start small, I guess, is the only way in. I yeah. don't know. You might say, let's use Revolution Fly instead of Luan for the rest of our shows. Um, might be a, a way in, or let's do it for one show and see how it goes or something. I think Edward also had something. I'm sorry, use what? Uh, Revolution Ply is, a, is a, a sort of a better version of Luan that is sustainably uh, harvested. It's not rainforest trees. Uh, it's not, I'm not sure it's available in every area, but um, I believe Yale uses it now in preference to Luan just because it's a better product, not even as a su chiefly sustainable um, yeah, I, I, I'm in the middle of West Texas. I bet it's not here. So. It might be, though. might be worth a look. Uh, Michael, can you just talk a little bit about Luan and why Luan is not a, an ideal choice? Um, yeah, well, a lot of Luan comes from, um, you know, old growth rainforests in, the, in Southeast Asia um, and uh, rainforests that are being cut down and not replanted. So it's, when you were talking about uh, Luan, it's really hard to know where it's or Luan covers a huge range of products um, in a large part of the world. It's really kind of synonymous with plywood. Um, and so we try not to use Luan because of the rainforest impacts. Um, there is such a thing as um, uh, FSC certified Luan, but I, I think Revolution Ply is even a superior product because it's, it's really grown from, grown, uh, made from conifers that are, um, that are really sustainably harvested. And I, I, I believe the, the source is domestic to the US. Tracy, I might suggest if you're in the, well, beautiful cat. Um, I love a cat in a Zoom meeting. Um, uh, if you're in the very enviable position of, of working with, uh, that you, you and your technical director are both still employed, um, you know, the, the time, if there is ever going to be a time to put together this local resource list or to do some research on, on other theaters that you might be able to combine storage with, like now is that time. Uh, you know, he is probably not designing shows right now. Um, and so to hopefully, like, that might help in your, your soft. And also to what other people said, like, approach it as a pilot. Just do some of the research now. Uh, uh, whether or not it's implemented, they've, they've done the groundwork so that if they have someone, a director or designer who comes in who's sustainably minded, it'll be a lot easier for them to adapt and uh, work that way. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping for that. We, we are still producing. We're a small, we're not a small community theater. We're one of the top 10 community theaters in the country, but we're out here in the middle of Texas and still able to uh, put together some small shows going on. So um, thank you all very much. I've got to go to another meeting, but thanks so much. Great. So we have uh, two hands that have been raised for a while, I see still. Uh, so Nadia. See your hand in the air. Hi, um, I'm with the Atlanta Green Theater Alliance and a production manager for the Atlanta Fringe here in Atlanta. 
And my question is about um, creating that inventory list. Are you guys using spreadsheets? Is there any other software that you recommend? Sandra and Michael, I saw you mentioned Reaply, which I've looked into and seems like an ideal solution. It's just very expensive. So, uh, you know, we're trying to put a fundraising plan together to see, but in the meantime, um, what else is everyone doing that's working or maybe not working as well as we want? Well, just uh, in terms of valuing the stock, yeah, it's all Excel with Google Sheets and that kind of thing. Um, and everything is priced as if we were building it new, if we're talking about scenery um, and our, our other lists are our spreadsheets for tracking. I think if we we're talking to other theaters um, in the in the neighborhood about kind of trying to pool those resources and that I think might be where we start to to move into um, Reaply, but you want to talk about Reaply? I, I would reach out to Reaply. They're a startup. They're super open to conversations about pricing, especially if you could potentially put together a couple organizations in the area. And they are interested in having nonprofit partners as well as for-profit clients, because sometimes they have excess stock uh, in the kind of some of their for-profit clients. So um, it might might be something a few theaters in an area could do together. In the chat. The name of that company. Great, Ashley. thank you. Hi, um, I am a prop artisan for Sleep No More. Um, well, before everything happened, and I had re been recently doing um, freelance prop design for smaller theater companies. And I think the biggest issue that I've run across with doing that is that um, while there are some resources like materials for the arts or finding cheap things on Craigslist, um, when the run is over, whether it's a one weekend show, two weekend show, there's rarely any room in the budget to where, where does all this stuff go? And the people who are running these tiny theater companies that don't have a space to store things, don't have any, don't even have like a, you know, um, I, and forgive me if this already exists, but I kind of had an idea if there's some sort of organization that would be able to come pick up things uh, and bring them to a stock, to a stock place after a run of a small theater. I just feel like there are so many tiny theater companies that are not well connected in these like big, exclusive um, Broadway or even like off-Broadway production companies that have spaces. It's usually like very exclusive to like professional prop designers. So I was just wondering if you had any ideas or suggestions for that. Yeah, Charlie. So uh, the off-Broadway uh, committee of the BGA did a town hall and put together a guide on resources in New York uh, for closing green. Um, and it has a bunch of those organizations. Um, we can send you that. It also um, analyzed the problems of doing what you've described um, and broke it down into five categories, time, information, etc. cetera. Um, the bottom line of much of it was that uh, it's too late to be thinking of at the end of the show. That's when every, everything's in crisis, everything uh, is done. So uh, the essential piece to be able to do that is to have your strike plan established when you start and to know these three things, these five things are going to be going there. And uh, as you're getting them, negotiate giving them back to that place. But if you when you start late, it's very hard. Thank you. I want to jump into that too. Um, Ashley, you know, a lot of us know the ABC, anything but costumes, which, which was a big prop shop that a lot of us use for, uh, you know, downtown off-Broadway work, has closed. And if this is COVID or something else, we don't know. But I think this is a real problem. I think it's a real problem that we, that there isn't spaces for there isn't value put upon used objects. Um, we tend to spec things that are new often. And so props people have, have, have taken our lead, I think as designers and are purchasing things that are new. And if we don't start valuing stock 
and valuing where and thinking really deeply about where we're going to house things if we are indeed going to do it this way and supporting those institutions because as soon, or, or businesses basically as soon as they go down we're all going to suffer and that's the situation we're in right now in new york city so um thank you for bringing this up Ashley. i think this is a great problem that we're going to have to start solving whenever we do come back for theater Thank you. We are at two o'clock. So I am going to officially end this session here uh, on behalf of stage managers everywhere. Um, I do believe that our panelists are free to stick around in this uh, Zoom. So am I correct? Nod? Yes? No? Okay, to stick around for a few minutes uh, for any further questions that linger for another five or 10 minutes or so. But otherwise, we will end this here um, after this incredible presentation and discussion. Thank you to our incredible panelists for sharing your knowledge with us today. Thank you to all of you for these great questions and discussions. And I am so thrilled that we get to continue this conversation next week for another hour as we delve into uh, more of this topic um, and continue to think about how to green our spaces during this intermission. Uh, so join us again, same place, uh, same time next Thursday, um, and we will be concluding our summer sessions, our first act one of our green quarantine, uh, the uh, following week, uh, July 30th, with a session on environmental justice by We Acts Taylor Morton. So please join us again for that as we close out the summer uh, of green quarantine before coming back again in the fall. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we will be in touch with a follow-up email and we will see you again next week. Thank you. Great. So if anyone who is sticking around does have a question, um, let's see if we are few enough to just unmute. Let's give it a minute. Yeah, we just only have a couple of sec, uh, a couple of minutes here, Sandra and I. Yeah, I know you guys are fabulous and in a library. We are in a library. <laughs> All right, I saw there was one hand that went up. Oh, Susan, yeah, that was me. I just wanted to. Uh, this was a feedback question. We didn't really get to feedback on your guide, but one of the things that struck me was the BGA has a as a um, principle of starting with low hanging fruit. And that isn't really in your thing, but that might be when in the start small, the idea of, of picking things that are easy wins, easy asks. Um, and the other thing we've found is that if you start with things that save money, it makes it way easier to then ask for other things. So you might think about in your um, start small, those two things to include that. Thanks, Susan. That's good advice. That's great. We're, we're talking about a, a lot of different sort of forms of this in terms of, yeah, a smaller cheat sheet for immediate action steps and longer. And um, yes, thank you for that feedback. Hey there, all friends. Um, great to see some of uh, your faces again. Um, you know, I'm in a unique situation where I deal with um, probably more than 100 designers in, a, in one season. And um, some of you are on this call. And, and that, those are generally the times when we have really stepped into this uh, green idea. Um, but more than that, we have the opposite. We have designers who are very, very strong about um, the things they want. And you know, if we don't have exactly the thing in our, I don't know, 30,000 square feet of storage, then uh, we're buying something new. Um, it's very challenging. So it's, it's giving me pause to say, hmm, can I really embrace uh, Mike's approach to say, well, this is what we're going to do. Um, I don't know. We'll see um, if, uh, if I can convince some of those designers to play uh, with us in that way or not. It's certainly, um, it, it's different muscles to work this way. I mean, the, the project that uh, we did with Sandra a couple years ago was uh, really awesome, um, but it really made us all work to figure out how to do it. It was exciting and fun, I think, for everyone in the end, but it was not straightforward. Uh, same when we worked with Danielle. Um, so um, I kind of wonder uh, what we might be doing to get the industry of designers more on board with uh, these ideas. 
So. I think that's so true, Jeff, what you said. I will say the one thing I hear very often is I hear designers say, I just, I, I wish more production managers were on board. And then I hear, Mike and I hear both because we hear both part sides of the conversation. He says the production manager is saying they want the designers on board. So maybe we can all just collectively agree that we're on board <laughs> and accept these limits. And I think I loved what you said about the muscle memory, like it's a new muscle. And as Susan said, it takes training on certain things that are, you know, you don't have to do the hardest thing first. I mean, I think education, uh, you know, it's pretty new, but I mean, I think all of us here, me, Lauren, Sandra, Michael, Danielle, uh, I don't know if Elizabeth is still on the call, but we all have given guest lectures at universities. So like, if that is uh, one of the titles that you hold is out of universities, get someone to talk, not just about the newest technology or something, but about sustainable design. Uh, and that will make more people excited about as they grow up. That's where we get the, the best receptive audiences at universities. And hopefully they'll take that into their careers. Great, Charlie. J Jeff, some, I know some others have heard me tell this story before, but I had lunch with a, a Tony Award-winning Broadway producer uh, who said to me at lunch, uh, I can understand what a designer can do to be more sustainable. I can understand what a stage manager can do, but what can I do? I'm the producer. Um, and uh, all the other conversations of those other people were, we need to get the producer to be aboard on this. Um, we can, how can we as designers, stage managers, we're doing what they asked us to do. My answer to her was, let people know this is important to you and they'll come up with things, they'll come up with designs, they'll initiate things. So it, it, no one role in this process does it themselves, but designers are trying to work with you like crazy. If you let them know that this is something uh, important to your institution to have greener designs in the process, people who had no interest in sustainability before will now have as part of their presentations um, why their version is more sustainable. So uh, my shorter answer would have been communicate early your interest in the topic and people will adapt and grow um, uh, to work with you since they know that's, uh, that's important. Um. Thanks, everybody. We really have to get out of here. We've Just overstayed our welcome. All so, right. Sandra and I are going to go. Thank, but we'll thank we'll you all. Week. We will end here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.